Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to Molten Modular DIY here in the exciting corner that gives birth to new modules, new and exciting things. Today's module is the Seb Songs Modular PolySeq. Now it's quite possible that this is the most extraordinary and most important module I will ever build. This could be the one that totally revolutionizes my approach to modular. It's interesting because it seems to have flown under the radar a little bit. Whereas as soon as I saw this, I twigged. I thought, there, this is it. This is important. This is something extraordinary. And so I set about finding out more about it. I was able to corner the guy at Superbooth and ask a few probably irrelevant questions because I wasn't really fully understanding it at that time. But now I believe that I do. And now I think I know why this is going to change my life. Does that sound a little bit overblown? Yeah, probably, right? But what it does is that it's a sequencer, a three-channel sequencer, but it doesn't sequence. It stores sequences. So rather than programming this, you record a sequence from somewhere else, so maybe from another sequencer, maybe from a keyboard. You can bang things into it, capture them in this, and then farm it out to three different synth voices. Now you can have the same sequence go into all three, you have different sequences go into each one, and you can switch between them on the fly. So what I'm trying to get at is that rather than taking one of those massive sequences, whether that's a keyboard, whether that's the uh, Keystep Pro, or the Black Sequencer, or ASQ1, these HP hungry sequences rather than having those you build your sequences at home stuff them into this then take this to your gig in your case not taking up anywhere near as much room and spin out your already created melodies into different parts of your case that i think is fantastic could really <laughs> could really be fascinating and as I say I've sort of followed this around and I've dropped loads and loads of hints that it'd be really good if, if I could get to build or try out this module but no Seb songs weren't going for it so I've had to buy the bleeding thing myself but that's actually a nice thing because it it connects me to it at a deeper level than than I ever get connected with something that's been giving to me so I bought this from Thonk it's not expensive uh, and I'm really, really looking forward to having all of my dreams realized by this being exactly what I think it is. Because that doesn't always happen. I've built modules in the past that turn out to be, I don't even know, <laughs> even know how this is supposed to work. And it's an odd thing when you're building, because when you buy a fully built module, you plug it in and your energy or your creativity is focused on uh, getting that to work and understanding it. When you build a module, a lot of that creative energy has sort of been drawn in to the building of it. And so when you get to the end and test it out, you probably need to go away for a couple of days and then come back to it. Because there's this element of you've exhausted yourself in the build process and perhaps you don't have enough of that wide-eyed expectation when it comes to testing the module itself. So that's why these build videos aren't really a review of this. It's a build guide. It's showing how to build this and to test it and to give you a demo and a flavor of what it's about rather than an in-depth review that I would do of a pre-built module. Does that make sense? So I'm excited about this one. I've bypassed a whole lot of other builds that I'm supposed to be doing just to get to this one. <laughs> Because I think it's I think it's important. Now I get the impression that it's not a big or complicated build. I think we're looking at sort of front panel bits, a little bit of Raspberry Pi sort of action, and again a lot of surface mount, which has been all done for us. Yeah, but hey, there we go. It'll do. It just means it will be a quick build, hopefully. And the build documents are all over on uh, thunk.co.uk. So that's what I'm building from today. So let's see what's in here. So let's have a look at the front panel. <laughs> I can't get in. Okay, here we go. So here we go. A very, very plain, very plain front panel. Not anything particularly exciting in that. It's just a good chunk of aluminium. That's all we've got so far. That's fine. So it's not going to be dazzling us with design or anything of that nature. Here's a PCB which does have 
a load of chips and resistors and bits and pieces already on it. So it looks like we've got a big microcontroller which is going to go here, the power header there, and then you've got knobs. Knobs and sockets. That's about it really. Shouldn't take too long, I don't think. And what's in here? Hopefully, it's everything else that we need. <laughs> oh, I don't know, there's some stuff here, look. LEDs, some capacitors. That looks like the Pico, what's it, Pico Pi? Pi Pico. Says it's already programmed. Power cable. Got some knobs. There's the side. Patch sockets, buttons, some headers, knob there. A weirdo knob. <laughs> some more of those. Some headers. It's like the power thing. Sticker. Bits and pieces. Good. Right. Not a whole lot to do. I think we should just get stuck on in. Turn the old soldier iron on. Let's have a look at the build guide. So first of all, let's get on with it. Got everything? Good, yes. Great capacitors. So C5, C6 and C11. Now there is a bit of materials on, on the website which you can check to make sure you have every bit. I'm just gonna assume that we do. I'm going to go with it like that because these always seem to be about the same. There's not a whole lot of component stuff going on. It's mainly just these three capacitors and they are all the same. So we've got a nice picture of all three. Getting this around the right way. So we have on the board itself we've got positive is labeled positive, positive, positive. And in most cases, I would say the long leg on your capacitor. The long leg is positive and the short leg is negative. And as we can see on the picture, you have, get this right way around, this goes positive at the top, negative at the bottom. So as you put that in, the negative is pointing down. And that's very clearly indicated on the build guide. Long leg positive, very good on the silk screen too. So they are all three pointing down. Brilliant. Begin by soldering in. Make sure you check polarity twice. See image of reference. Well, the images have been great. So it's negative to the bottom, positive to the top, all three in. Let's, uh, let's do that. So let's go. Oh, I'm off to a great start just moving the thing around. That's good. Trying to keep things under control a little bit. <laughs> Completely missed. Now I know there are helping hands and various tools and vices you can use to make soldering less interesting. I prefer the adventure of balancing components on top of each other and trying to solder while it's under movement. That always appeals to me. There, there you go, that was easy. Two, three. And they're all in. Nice. Let's cut those off. Okay, next it's talking about headers. So talking about the power header to start with which is this. So for this, we're flipping to this side of the board and you can see with the screen print where the hole in the thing goes. Like so. Is there anything else that's gonna to have to go on this side? Well, this big whacking great thing there. So of the power connector. Then we're gonna to have to do those bits for that. All right, I'm going to follow the instructions rather than trying to do it all my, 
by myself thinking that I know best. So that is definitely in the right orientation like that. I'm just going to turn it over and we'll try to get it flat as we solder it. So I'm going to push down and do one leg over here. So push down so it's flat, heat all that up, apply some solder, try to hold it while it settles then pick it up and have a look. That looks pretty good to me. So do the rest of the legs. Lovely, next bit. So we've now got these headers, pokey and sockety ones. So I think the plan is to put them together. It's always hard to solder something, to solder headers and then try to get them match up afterwards. It's much better to have them matched up, soldered and then pulled apart, if that makes sense. So I've got these two things here. So it says fit the 20 pin headers with the 20 pin sockets and then place the fitted headers on the PCB with the sockets facing down towards the PCB and the pins hang uh, facing upwards. Place a Raspberry Pi on the top. So what this means is that I've put the, uh, pull this apart. the pins are on this one and that's the socket. So the pins are going to go in. like so and then we're going to want to place the Raspberry Pico Pi on the top that's the fella so this goes it says USB here so it goes that way around there's a USB port so that's going to fit on top like so beautiful Solder all 40 joints on the Raspberry Pi Pico and then solder the headers onto the other side while it's still attached. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to solder this whole thing on and solder this whole thing on and then pull it apart. So that's a good chunk of little bit of soldering. Maybe I'll I'll see because you just got to do it in place. There's no it's not as if it's going to be all over the place. It's fairly secure. You're not worried about it falling out. I'm not having to turn it upside down at this point. So I'm just going to do all of that. And then that's. You know, I think that's going to be good. I think that's going to be good. Just be aware of the surface mount stuff. Don't try to uh, accidentally desolder something you're not supposed to desolder. So with doing it on the other side, I'm just going to be a little bit more careful. So I'm going to hold it down and do a corner, just so that's nice, nice and flat and in there. That's looking good. I'm going to do an opposite corner. That's also looking good, so I'll just run through the rest of them. Excellent, all done. So now you have to pull that out again because there's actually stuff we need to solder in between. So you should be able to gently see I've done this 
completely differently. I've done this backwards. How have I done this backwards? Yeah, see, but that's not what they said, was it? It said, right, when you put these bits in, fit the 20 pin headers with the 20 pin sockets that are shown in the image. Place the fitted headers on the PCB with the sockets facing down towards the PC and the pin headers facing up. So that's what I did. Pin headers facing up. Isn't that right? <laughs> Whereas down here, they've got the sockets. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. On the build guide, they've got the sockets there. Whereas I've put the sockets on there. Does it matter is the question at this time. I don't think it matters. I just find it odd that I've either interpreted their instructions completely backwards the pins facing up. <laughs> that's, that's what I did. I mean, I guess it makes sense to put the pins into the into the processor because the processor would generally have pins off the bottom that would socket into something. And so, in that regard, you're you're soldering a socket onto here into which the Raspberry Pi goes. But that's oh. I don't know. Does it matter again? I don't think it I don't think it matters. Is it going to make it more difficult for me to solder under here? No, in fact, actually this will make it easier because I'm less likely to melt if I had these bits on there. The likelihood is I'll get my solder iron in, I'll be I'll be melting and leaning against it. So I think I've done it the better way. Anyway, moving on, moving on. So, potentiometers, switches, and jacks. Protruding lines must face downwards towards the jacks. Protruding lines? It's exciting. So flip the PCB over. Put this to one side for the moment. Place all jacks, pots, rotary switch, and momentary switches. Make sure all six switches have their protruding lines pointing down towards the jacks. Well, let's do those first then. So these are the switches. Turn this around the right way. They seem to go here. So protruding line. Right, so if you if you look at this. See so on one side there seem to be a little a little pointy line that there isn't on the other side. I think that's what they're talking about. Make sure the six momentary switches have the protruding lines pointing down, i.e. align the switches with the silk screen. So on the silk screen, on here, they've all got a little nodule at the bottom, which is partially obscured by the LED right in here. But you can see on this one that it definitely has that. So these should be in that orientation. With the line down. I think that's right. They could do with just a slightly angled picture just to confirm that. But yeah, that's what I believe it needs to be. So do you see that all the lines are facing down this way? All the lines on the front of those? Yeah, that's it. That's definitely it. So big pot goes at the top here. Then you've got jack socket. So with these, See the little twangy end there? That goes into the hole that's outside the square, outside itself, that's the earth bit there. That goes in, you stick that in first, push against it. The rest of it should pop in nicely. That's that. Got the rest of these down here. Now these all have their own twangy leg bit. Sometimes you have these on some builds that share them in the middle, sort of like that. But these ones don't, they all have their own, so might as well use that. Because it's a darn sight less fiddly. Then we've got this enormous knob here, which appears, see you've got this sort of bendy bit on the front here. That appears to be pointing towards the top, so it looks like it's in that orientation. 
that seems to be the way. That's in. Nothing else threw itself out particularly. So place all jacks, potentiometers, rotary switch and momentary switches. That's what we've done. Align with a silk screen. Fit front panel. Hand tighten all knobs. What they mean is is nuts, not knobs. But anyway, so we get our front panel. Place it over the top. So we haven't done any soldering on these yet. We're working up to it. So wobble that through. And then hand tighten. These are then the nuts for patch sockets. Now is this going to come off? It's probably going to come off, isn't it? Because I haven't done the LEDs. So I'm probably going to have to take all those off again, but hey, that's fine. Hand tighten, did that. Right, solder all the joints for the jacks, switches and temperatures. Make sure to push the momentary switches against the PCB when soldering them. Okay. Against the PCB. So when you turn this over, all of those switches have now kind of disappeared. So that is a thing now potentially I could take the knobs out and that might make this whole lot easier to solder because I'm going to have to do something big enough that to put up against that so that these that means we've got to take it all off again hmm but I think the best way to do this is to take these knobs out now the danger is, if those pots aren't in place, then the whole thing's not going to line up because they are, they are very good at keeping everything in its right place. But I'm going to throw caution to the wind just a little bit. I'm still going to put these on. Right, so now if I turn this over, all of the momentary switches are now pushing through. Yeah, you see that? You see that? See, I think that's a better idea. And I don't think that's going to cause us any unnecessary difficulty. So let's do that. All right, made a decision. Good. Right, stick with it. What I'm not going to do, I'm not going to solder the jack sockets just yet. I'm going to do those at the same time as the, as the knobs. So I'm just looking at doing the switches. I have terribly unsteady hands today. Okay, it's possible that that particular switch there is a little bit wonky. Like that one was not pushed up perhaps as well as it could have been. Yeah, I think I've now got some trouble going on with the the location of these buttons. See, even the way that I did it, they weren't they didn't end up being completely flat. I wasn't pushing down hard enough on them. So now I've got the issue that I put that one down and it doesn't always come back out. Now it might recover as I put these on, but do I want to put these on yet? Because it may be that they don't come off too easy. And they probably need to go through the hole but then that, in some ways, that's what I should have had on in the first place, if that was the case. <laughs> All right, I might make the right pig's ear of this now. Maybe they should have been on. That way they're going to be going through. Anyway, right, so what was I doing? So I got LEDs. See, that was what I, perhaps I did wrong there. Because what I didn't see was that they'd already put the caps on. Ah, oh, you see, that's what I didn't see. All right, so I've made a right mess of that because what we should have done, we should have had the caps on. So this is really important. So I've soldered these on without these bits on. What I should have done is had the caps on and that would have straightened them all up. Ah, oh, you idiot. You idiot. Ah. 
So what am I going to do? <laughs> because here, I guess in this picture, they already have the caps on. Ah, you just need to have a mention because the caps are separate. So I think it would be really good if you stick in that little build guide there. Put the caps on when you place them. Just for idiots like myself. Because now I've got a bit of a problem I'm going to have to try to sort out. So let's put these on now. So they just push on. Now this doesn't negate my doing the momentary switches by themselves, which is still a good idea because the height is still a problem. But the problem that I have created for myself is that this is now not going to go on very well. Now let's see if I can fudge it, see how bad it could be. But it's applying a little bit of tension to the whole thing. Not able to get it entirely down over there. Okay, that's better. Right, well look, they're all through. That one sticks. So does that one. And that one. <laughs> so half of them stick. Half of them stick. That one, that one, and that one. The rest get away with it. So what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to suck solder off that one. That's really, this is not good. This is not good. Well, I mean, what I might try, let's see if I can wobble it a little bit by um, just giving it, so where does it need, where does it need to go? If I heat up some, push down on it, just see whether I can get it to move a little bit that's better so let's try to do it on this one so all i really did was heat each leg and i'm pushing down and if i can just get a little bit of movement Okay, so this one still not going for it. Maybe I was heating the wrong one. <laughs> All right, let's give that one a go. So I'm going to just push in. So this time it's now pushing against the PCB really well. Sort of trying to apply pressure as much as I can. Yes. All right. You know what? I think I got away with it. I think I bloody got away with it. <laughs> well, I didn't get away with it, away with it, because I had to do a whole load of work just to try to get it, bring it back together. Yeah, all right, I reckon that's all right. Okay, so what we learned from this is you really do need to examine the pictures and make sure you put those bits on first. I mean, that makes more sense the more I think about it, obviously, because you're putting the front panel on. And there's nothing to hold those switches in place if they don't have their little caps on. So it makes complete sense. However, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Thonk out there, I put a note on it. Put a note on the build guide just to say, make sure you put the caps on because they come separately. Uh, and there's no point at which it tells you to put those on the switches. It just assumes that they're already on. And you don't really, because of the angle of the picture, you don't really see that completely clearly. I mean, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. Thank you. So, back to where we were. <laughs> Sold all the joints. Make sure to push the momentary switches. Yeah, no, LEDs. Undo all the nuts and take off the front panel. Right, okay, so this may yet be a bit more troublesome. But, oh, no, hang on, hang on. I haven't soldered the pots and bits. <laughs> so before I do all that. Good gracious, I almost blew it again. So at this point, sold all the pots and all the patch sockets. Good oh. <laughs> I'll see you after.
Okay, that's everything soldered, except for the LEDs now. So we've got to take everything off again. Place the right LED in its corresponding position. <laughs> Colors should be fitted in the following order, top to bottom, yellow, red, green and orange. So let's get our LEDs out. So fit them in the right place, they say. So this is the front panel. This is the side they're going to go on. And I have a red, a yellow, orange and green. Four oranges. So they should go yellow, red, green. So we've got yellow, red, green here and then orange across the bottom. That seems to be the plan. So yellow at the top here. So what we're looking for is long leg positive. Just about got a long leg on that. And there's no positive mark. <laughs> Darn it. Okay. So with these, uh, rather than having a positive sign next to the positive leg, they t they've got a line. They've got a straight line. You can see that? That there is a straight line, which should go with the straight line the flat side on the LED. Now these LEDs don't particularly have a flat side because of the sort of ones that they are. But the flat side corresponds, generally speaking, to negative. So in which case the long leg is going to go here and the short leg is going to go on the side that has the flat bit on it. Difficult to see with the screen print and the holes going through it. But that is what I'm going to go for. Now, does this give me any more information? Yes, it does. <laughs> so they've got a nice big picture here, which is brilliant, which tells you exactly what I've just said. So the positive side is the round side, the negative side is the flattened side, and the long leg is positive. So yellow, then red. So long leg to the right hand side, short leg to there, then the green. Long leg, right side, short leg to the flat side. Good. And the same with these four down here. They're all got the same orientation, which is very, very helpful. So long leg to the right. Long leg to the right. Good. So once those are placed, make sure I get the polarity right. Yeah, did that flat side. Yeah. Image for reference. Fit the front panel jacks. Uh, fit the front panel to the jacks and switches and pots again. And push them out of their holes, but don't do them yet. Okay. So those are all in, which is lovely. This goes over the top. Hopefully this is the last time we're going to have to do it all up. So bear with me while I put all these things on again. OK, so that's the front panel back on. Now what you want to do is get all these LEDs to go sticking through their holes. So just give them a wobble and you should find that they will... <laughs> find their holes like so now obviously if I turn this over to show you they're all going to fall out again but you can just about see them all poking through yeah you don't really want them poking through you want them flush that seems to be the plan so what they're suggesting is to put the whole module on its side and try to push the LED so that they are flush with the front panel then use masking tape to make this easier and solder the LEDs when you have them flush. So you could put them down like this and then sort of put them like that. So that they're, so that they're good and then solder them. Problem is that you're more likely going to something bad's going to happen. 
So you could put masking tape on, although it's a little bit tricky because there's all these other things around them. So I think if you push up against it and just give the legs a little bend, I think that is going to help. <laughs> so I'm going to put my finger over that one and just bend the legs a little bit just so it holds it in place. <laughs> I don't know. This just seems like a good idea. I'm going with it. But a bit of masking tape is probably the answer, really. I mean, personally, I don't really mind that much if these things are not completely flush. See, that one's fallen out completely, which, of course, because I don't want to turn it up that way around. You dipstick. All right, so how how is it? How is this going to work? How is it going to work? Okay, that's all back in. So they're sticking through a little bit, but you know what? I don't really mind. I don't really mind. So I'm just going to solder them. I'm going to solder them like that. I'm just going for it. Getting on with my life. Not being distracted by such technicalities. And what I could do is I'm just going to solder one leg. Because what that means is that I can check them. And if one is ridiculous, I can use one hand to heat that one particular leg and then move it and adjust it a little bit because the solder's already on there. That sounds like a plan. So any of them ridiculous? No, they're fine. They're a little bit protruding down here. You can see a little bit protruding but that's all right. That's all right for me. That's good enough. <laughs> I'm just going to get on with it. Part of the joy of doing DIY is that you can personalise things. You can make things more your own by the way you fudge it up as you go. So any any kind of fudging, any kind of uh, bits that you break, melt, fall off, discolour, just make it more of your own module. And that's a good thing. That's a nice thing. That's a positive thing. Splendid. 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 Look at those. Look at those. So Mr. Pi has to go back on. So they've got USB, USB socket there, there, sits on. And then it'll just be a bit spiky into your fingers as you get that in. Looks good. Then we've got a little bit of knob action. Let's tighten all the bits a little bit. I still tend to go for finger tight for most, most things. It's good enough for me. So are these different? No, the knobs look the same. These are all D-type knobs. So, what? That can only go one way on. That's on one. One, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nothing else I need on there. No, okay. Push that on. Super. This one, they can only go on one way because of the. Now we've got tempo and swing. That's interesting. So that's going the whole way. Push that down. Let me actually have that a little bit further off. Just so it's not rubbing. Okay, so that's looking great. I mean it's quite a simple module as it goes. There's not a whole lot to it. The depth is easy. Just got the power socket here is all it's going to need. We're going to need to work out whether we need to um, update the firmware, that kind of thing. Otherwise, it's looking pretty good. <laughs> looking pretty good. So this says, before powering on, measure resistance with the multimeter between ground to make sure there's no short. 
Oh, well, sod that. If it blows up, it blows up. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. If it blows up, it's gone. I, yeah, that's it. I've, I've ceased, ceased caring at this point. Let's plug it into something and see if I can see if I can run a sequence. Right, we're ready to test the PolySeq. I've just got a synth voice set up here. So the idea is that the PolySeq will record these notes and play them back. The idea beyond the idea is that with something like the, the Keyset 37 here, I can create a sequence and I can put it into a synth voice and I can enjoy that. But I can't then create another sequence for another voice because it only has one channel of stuff coming out. So what I hope is going to happen here is that I can create notes on this. It will be recorded into the PolySeq and then I do another one and I've got two sequences then three sequences. And that is completely awesome. So that's that's what we're trying to achieve here. Now my understanding is that the firmware is all this is already loaded up and already good to go. So I'm going to turn this power off. Plug this in, hopefully the right way around. And it says at first power on, hold mode and record. See that's mode. I think this is record. So I'm going to hold those two in. <laughs> do I do that? Put it down. I'm just looking for smoke at the moment. Mode and record. Turn it on. Got some lights. For a couple of seconds until the red record LED blinks. Well, it hasn't blinked. This is blinking. Anyway, let's, let's see whether it works. So connect CV gate keyboard to the CV gate inputs. Press record and play some notes. Press record. Okay, I think we can, we can quite clearly see <laughs> that the the pitch isn't working the cv side isn't working the gate side seems to be fine i can do ties i can do rests that's easy what's not happening is any kind of pitch change calibration to calibrate the cp input to read voltage voltage do the following connect voltage voltage cv gate to the cv and gate inputs okay press and hold this on power up let go and the orange switch starts. Okay, so there's some calibration that needs to be done. That's good. So let's turn this off. That would be useful to have that in the build guide, wouldn't it? Core heck, would it? So calibration mode. To calibrate the CV input, connect CV and gate, press and hold rest mode, power up. Let go when the orange LED is fading in and out. Okay, so this is what I had to start with. So it's possible that I started it up trying to follow the instructions <laughs> and I put it in calibration mode and then screwed it up. That's completely possible. Now we're in calibration mode now that this is flashing. So it says, press and hold the key corresponding to naught volts <sighs> and wait until the thing lights up. Now I don't know what that is. What's good? <sighs> now I've done this before. I just can't quite remember. So let's get this thing out. So DC. So I want to attach this to there and there. So I now need to find naught volts. There you go. Is that naught volts? In which case that should be one volt. Yeah, two volts. So the bottom octave here is naught volts. So that's what I want. So I need to plug that back into here. So I press and hold naught volts until that lights up, which it has. So that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that should now be six volts. Press that until number two holds up. Yeah, okay. Two is now lit. Finally, press this to return to normal operation. So I stick it into record. It could be there. Oh yes! So 
taking some of my own advice for a change, I decided to come back a couple of days later to finish off what I was doing with the Polyseek, which is now planted into my This Is My Current Rack rack, if you know what I mean. I kind of got into a little bit of trouble over here because the, the voices I was using were clashing and not working and there's other sort of issues and stuff that I needed to start looking at which was very distracting from what the Polyseek was doing because that has nothing to do with the Polyseek at all. I just got in a mess and a knot over here. So I've come back a little bit later, a couple of days, put it in here and I'm going to be using this quite a bit I think because it's fabulous and I just wanted to give you a quick demo just of the basics not in anything in particular deep just what i've learned so far in fiddling about so there's a lot more in here that could happen and also there's a new firmware on the way which i think is going to elevate it again to even greater heights and so at that point i'll do a proper video and a proper review of it but just to finish off this build video let me show you let me show you what it can do Right, let's give this a go. Let's assume that it's all working and it all tested out fine. There was no smoke. I understand the firmware works. You know, all the bits I was sort of fudging around with, it's all smooth and beautiful now. So what I'm going to attempt to do, I'm going to attempt to record three sequences from here into here and then use those in a patch of some sort. Just quick and, and easy and hopefully lovingly Lee. Now the way that works is that you've got the output from here going into the input here and this output here going to, I've got it going to the acronym through a filter, just just simple. I haven't got it going through a VCA or anything like that, just simple through the filter. And what you do is hit record and then you record your, your sequence. So you get monitoring through when you press the record button so you should be able to hear it happening so you can then play it. So something like that. <laughs> I had the I had the this down the whole time so you couldn't really hear that. But now if I hit play So that sequence is now stored into memory location one. If I go to memory two, that's not going to make any difference at all. What I need to do is turn channel one into to, to point at this one. So I hold channel one and I give it a nudge and now that's going to be on sequence two, which currently isn't anything. So if I press record, I can now put in a sequence. So I'm going to put in something with some rests. Quite sure how I did that but that's exciting nonetheless so I've now got that and I've got this other sequence going on <laughs> so let's go to sequence number three <laughs> that was hilarious put it in record and now I'm gonna put in a whole bunch of rests let's stick in some stuff have my three sequences what I'll do is I'll allocate uh, one sequence to each channel and have three things playing got it right so channel one put that onto one channel two put that to two channel three put that to three that should just work right so I need to patch in a couple of things so let's go for channel two 
into the surface. I need to take the gate, put that into the trigger. And number three, I'm going to stick it to the pizza. And I'm going to stick the gate, in fact, let me turn that around, Let's take the gate into an envelope over there, take the output, plug that into Volt Per Octave. And with a bit of luck, it should all work. It should just all work. Let's see what happens. So you've got different things going on, I can see that. Let's turn up channel two. Interesting, potentially. <laughs> so this is on channel two. If I press the mode button, I can change the mode of channel two. It's now reversed. If I press it again. now doing like a ping pong up and down I press it again it then does kind of a randomization on those notes but the gates are different you know the gates and pitch changes seem to be divorced from each other which is very very interesting so it's now kind of doing its own thing which I like a great deal I can change the whatever sequence each channel is using.
mean, that that's it. That that's that's all it is. I mean, what it requires of you is to have a little bit of an idea as to what you want to put into the policy. I mean, I've just made up a couple of random sequences, but if you thought about it, if you thought about how you wanted three layers of stuff to work with each other, then you could put some really interesting things in. I mean, heck, you could write the sequence on another sequencer. So I could use my eight-step sequencer here, or the sequencer on this, or the black sequencer or something, and then just record it in to the polyseq for when you use it at a gig. Which is just brilliant. <laughs> and now I've got a performative changeable sequencer without having to take a keyboard or something much more massive in order to achieve that. And you've got mutes and glides and skips and ties and rests and other modes and reversing and all sorts of interesting things in here and more things to come. There you go, that's the Polyseek. So there you have it, the Polyseek from Subsong's Modular. Fascinating, I, I totally love it. I'm in love with this module already. It's going to be enormously helpful. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna to try to do a gig next week. You know, just a simple Imam at, at Norwich, just 15 minutes worth of stuff, and I think that's going to work perfectly. Well, at least I'm gonna try that out see if that works, see if that's inspirational, see if it doesn't feel pre-recorded. Do you know what I mean by that? Because often I think when doing modular you kind of feel like you need to conjure up the entire thing in the spur of the moment, when actually that's not the reality of what you do. You tend to have a lot of stuff patched and ready to go. And this is certainly going to do that. It will just feel odd not having a sequencer that I can mess with and I'm going to have to overcome that or maybe I'll run a sequencer as well. I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that's for another day just to finish off this video and say that uh, it was a good build, an easy build. I made a right hash of it by not looking closely enough at the photos and so make sure that you do that. Make sure you look closely and that yours is looking the same as theirs because you know, all the mistakes that I made were just through me not looking closely enough. But I think that made ultimately for an entertaining <laughs> an entertaining build but anyway in terms of the the build itself you know straightforward the instructions from thonk were, were great they do a good job the kit itself it had all the bits in that i needed it's very easy to put together very straightforward provided as i say that you examine the the documents the the comments that i made during the build you know take a look at that thonk if, if that's okay i think it will be worthwhile just pointing out that you need to put those little caps on you know <laughs> That thing would save people a lot of trouble. But in terms of the functionality of this thing, it's just beautifully simple and perfect. And I, I like that a lot. So hopefully in a few weeks time, I'll do another video on it with its new firmware and I'll be able to show you exactly what it is that it does. And you'll be able to see whether that's something that's really, really floats your boat or not. And I almost guarantee that it will, kind of. Although I'm already seeing reasons why perhaps it could be restrictive because you know you like to play with sequences but then there's a lot of play in here too interesting interesting indeed interesting and also Seb Song's modular has a new module coming out shortly a sampler one sort of lo-fi 12-bit sampling interesting interesting so I mean it all comes down to what you can do with that because I've tried a few sampling based uh, modules and they've not always lived up to what I thought they might be able to do <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see how well this one works but based on the thought process that went into the polyseek then I've got high hopes for what's in their sampler module we will see so there you go I hope that was helpful and in the meantime go make some tunes <laughs>